And hey there, I'm Dave Wagner. Welcome to another episode of... Come on down! This is Rich Fields right here. This Rich, is Dave Wagner. Yeah, this, Rich is a, a game show <laughs> aficionado. Knows everything about game shows, it seems, anyway. I know a lot. Yeah, you do seem to know a lot. How many game shows were you involved in? Uh, eight total. Yeah. Seven network, one local, state of Florida. You know, Price is Right, yeah. Wheel of Fortune, Family Feud would probably be the biggest ones. Yeah, you were known as, as being the announcer on the Price yeah. is Right so for a good while. go-to guy there yeah. for a while. So this is a, a podcast about bells, buzzers, anything game show related. So I'll, we talk a lot about game shows, and we have some really interesting guests. We do. Yeah. Uh, it's fun. We've had some, uh, some producers on. We've had some uh, talent on. And... Uh, we're, today, shoot, today, we're shooting with another talent. Today we're going to have a big today, talent on. Yeah. A good one. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, welcome uh, original Barker Beauty, Kathleen Bradley. Come on down. <laughs> there she is. Get closer to your mic, Kathleen. We can barely okay, hear you. Yeah, I do. I know. And the, and the mic is over there. And the oh, stuff. you look fantastic, man. I like the palatial suite behind you. It's very nice. So welcome to the show, Kathleen, uh, and I know Dave, you know this, I'm saying it really for the benefit of the uh, audience watching, Kathleen has written a book, and uh, it's been out there for a while, mm -hmm. but boy, it's just as timely now as it ever was. It's called Backstage at the Price is Right, Memoirs of a Barker Beauty. When, when did you write this, Kathleen? I actually wrote it uh, probably and started writing like in 2010. It took me two or three years to complete it, and it actually got uh, published, which I self-published in 2014. How does that self-publishing work? Okay, everything? It, it, it's more than a notion, I'll tell you. <laughs> and I, that wasn't my first choice. Obviously, I did want to try to get a uh, publisher, uh, and I did try a little bit, but not, I didn't try hard enough, and I had some friends in the business try to give it a go and help me out. And uh, so my husband and I, we just decided, hey, let's just go ahead and self-publish right now because I really wanted to get it out. And uh, we did a lot of the graphic and artwork, and I wrote it all by myself. I had some people who proofread it and helped me with a little bit of the grammar and different things of that nature. And we inserted the photos and did all the layouts and everything. So it was quite an accomplishment, but it was fun that we were able to do it and I've done uh, graphic work and things of that nature before but uh, self-publishing is it's kind of tough it really is but it, it's you know it is what it is speaking of photos in the book the cover photo wow <laughs> very nice thank you did you take that yes. just for the uh, for the book you know what actually I took that picture prior to being on the prices right when I was in a movie, I starred in a movie, it was called um, Perfume. And I was one of the main characters, her name was Vashti. And the photographer, he took this, and actually I did Playgirl magazine. Uh, uh, I think it was Playgirl, I forget, one of the magazines. And they used this for one of the front covers and inside cover. And they did a story on the movie. So I liked this picture uh, all along, and I thought, wow, this will capture some attention, I think. Yeah, sure will. That's for sure. <laughs> Kathleen, uh, take us back a little bit. I know you're, uh, you're a Buckeye. I'm a Buckeye. Rich is a Buckeye. We're all Buckeyes here, so you're in, you're in good company. But, but let's talk a little bit about how you began in the show business. You started out modeling, is that correct? I know you had a, a disco career, and I want to talk to you about that in a moment here. But uh, let, let's talk a little bit about how you sort of transition, navigate your way to the prices. Right. How did you start out? Okay, well, those kind of both add up to when you said disco, but with the singing group. Let me say, when I left high school in Girard, Ohio, and I, I always knew I wanted to be in show business and always had inspired to be an entertainer of, to some degree. But I did model back in Ohio for a few little fashion shows and a few little of the local newspapers for the department stores. And I loved modeling. I thought it was great. And once again, between modeling, acting, and singing career, any type of entertainment and performing, I was always ready and prepared for it. So when I came to Los Angeles, I did do some modeling and uh, just a little bit here and there. And I was in a lot of pageants, beauty pageants. I entered into the Miss 
fine brown frame pageant. I was in Miss Hot Pants contest. <laughs> Anything you did, it, I wanted to get that exposure. And yeah. back then it was in the early 70s. So we didn't have social media. And that was probably one of the best ways that gal could be seen and uh, on the masses to let people know, hey, this is a pretty girl. She, she's got a great bod. She can model. She smiles well. And to, you know, hopefully take me to another level. Yeah. So in doing that, though, I did uh, a guy named John Daniels from Mavericks Flat. He was putting a girl singing group together called The Love Machine. And he entered, I entered into the Miss Black America beauty pageant. And then I won the pageant and he put the girls group together. So I did travel around a lot, a lot with the girls group. And after that though, I just wanted to get back into modeling when I got out of the group. You know, and I did I, model, I had a family, yeah. Yeah, and I do want to say, I listened to Hey Kids on the way in here. <laughs> and uh, the song, Hey Kids. And uh, there's a great uh, bass. There's a great funk to that song. And and I also listened to, I think it was, I've got the music in me as well. That was terrific. Right. Your voice is terrific. Do you still sing at all? That's when I was with the group Destination. I was with actually two singing groups. The first one was The Love Machine. Seven females. We sang and danced. We, we worked all over Europe. Italy, Germany, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland. Uh, Central Bay, Paris was our second home. And then after that, I did get with the group Destination. That's the one. Uh, well, no, that was when we did Curtis Mayfield's makeup. I take that back. I've done so much, you know, yeah, so yeah. hard to and tell. And Plastic but Man, I, you did also. I still love to sing. I've had people offer me to do some singing in a couple of clubs and, and engagements and on a little bit of a background for some vocals on their music. But I'm not in the business of singing right now, though I do love it. I I'll, will always love it. Performing and, and sing. You and I have a uh, mutual Facebook friend who has a little bit of a talent. The guy's name is Jason Kelly. Are you familiar with him at all? Ah, uh, yes, Jason. <laughs> he, he, did a, he did a fantastic drawing of me. There it is on your screen right now. And I know he's wow, done one of you as well with uh, right. uh, <laughs> Nikki, I guess. I'm not sure. Who, yeah, who? I, I think, yeah, Nikki, one of the, one of the blondes. <laughs> but, but Jason should be your... Your, your agent, because he wrote Dave and I to say this. Check it out. Okay, uh, it says Rich and Dude. They call me sometimes uh, the, dude the Dude here. Check it out. Aside from Price and the Friday movies, you may have seen Kathleen in other shows like A Different World, Good Times, and the, uh, the Soap, A House Divided. All Black. All Black Soap. Uh, let me see. Other movies include Harlem Nights, Troop Beverly Hills, Perfume, Dolomite's Daughters, A Day of Trouble. Uh, Malibu Bikini Shop and Checks and Balances. Cat uh, was even featured in music videos. Uh, my First Night with You and Dr. Dre, Bad Intentions. This Lady Gets Around. She was also singing in groups like Destination and The Love Machine. Wow. That is, that is your next agent. <laughs> he should be your agent. That is. Right. And Jason, bless his heart, he's been such a big fan for so many years. And you know, it's kind of odd how we met. He was a big fan. He was like, actually, at the beginning, a little scary, obsessive fan. <laughs> so, Aren't they yeah. all, though? <laughs> Not all of them, but Not some all. of them are. And I even have a chapter in my book, and I, I do give him uh, credence and kudos. And uh, then I have uh, a chapter in there talking about prisoners of love. And all of the fan mail we used to get from the prisons and the different things. Some of them were pretty scary. But after a while, Jason, you know, became kind of a warm, nice person. He sent the picture in. And I was with my family. Uh, we had a podcast. It was radio. But, um, um, uh, you know, uh, you can see it on YouTube and everything as well. And it was called It's a Family Affair. So Jason would call in. He was one of our biggest supporters and fans. And uh, to this day, he's been just a great fan and friend through our uh, social media we communicate yeah we thank jason for giving us a rundown and everything that's very nice let me take you back in time i'm going to play you a little something and then i'm going to come back to you check this out but i've had to get my beauties all together out here since kathleen has become barker's beauty right here 
I want to point out now that Janice Kathleen dances, so that's going to take She's a little a bit of press, pressure off you, you know. You've mm -hmm. been our, our dancer most of the uh -huh. time. And I want you to know, Diane, that she, Kathleen looks great in a swimsuit, so you're going to be able to put your clothes on once in a while oh, now. That's great. And she's promised, Holly, she, Kathleen promised me that she's going to stumble and drop things a little, so you won't look so bad either. <laughs> You'll do all those things, won't you? Yes, I'll try to be very well-rounded and pick up the pace. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, very nice. And Bob welcomes to the show officially. What was that like for you? Oh my God, just looking back at it, it's so heartwarming. It almost brings me to tears, I'm serious. I had so many great, wonderful years on there for 10 years, but just to be at it as the final first African-American model on that show was quite an achievement. It was a pleasure. I mean, it was something that uh, I had hoped for, prayed for and claimed as it was a very arduous, Task going through it was like six months of auditioning with other models that were in contention and just to be able to get that phone call from my agent and say Kathleen how would you like to be the next Bob Barker Beauty well yeah duh what if who I made that call? This? Who, who called you with that <laughs> news Unit Fontaine my agency from the Fontaine uh, agency modeling agency and, and she was uh, for commercial, commercials and theatrical as well at some point. Huh. And your audition, was it in front of Mr. Goodson? Uh, no, actually it was quite, I'm telling you, it took six months. The first audition I had to do, I just had my son, after three months, it was, I was on my second marriage, like, I don't want to say on my second marriage, <laughs> after my second marriage. <laughs> I ha just had a son, and it was three months I got the call. So basically, you know, in this business, your body and your face is your passport. You must always be prepared and have it ready, and you cannot let it expire. So I was already in good shape, pretty decent shape, ready to kind of get back to work after a while. And my agent called and said, Kathleen, they're looking for a model for CBS. They have to do some more diversity in their programming with uh, minorities, and they're looking for a black model for The Price is Right. They'd like for you to come in, go audition. I auditioned and went in for it. Just, and she said, but you have to wear a swimsuit. How's your body? I said, it's okay. I did it one <laughs> week. I myself a little more before I went in. And I saw Philip Wayne Rossi, who was one of the producers, and yep. Roger Dockowitz. Yep. He was there as well. So they talked to me and everything. And then at some point, I had to disrobe. And, you know, they were looking for a swimsuit model in particular as well. So they liked me, and they called me back in to do uh, a week's worth of shows. At that time, we were doing, no, I didn't think I did a work. I think I did one day. We did three shows a day and did three shows, uh, I mean, three days a week. So we were doing, taking nine shows a week. Wow. And I did do a series of different shows. They would call some girls in, have them on, and air them and everything and what have you so it just went kind of well they kept calling me back and calling calling me back for at least six months i did quite a few shows and they finally came to their senses oh lee i could have told you i'm the one and that's nice that's nice how intimidating of a process was that for you kathleen when you first day on the air you're out there you know this is a big show with a long history how tough was it for you? To be very honest with you, it wasn't that tough for me because I've always been in show business. So I was used to be in, being in front of the audience, in front of a crowd. I felt really just right at home. And the fact that Diane, Harley, Janice, and myself, all of the models, we were pretty much in the same age range. Some of the other models they saw were quite young like they could have been our daughters, okay. <laughs> but I fit in and I had a very good conversation with the girls as well. And they made me feel comfortable and that, you know, my world traveling, I think had a lot to do with it, that I had a lot to offer and talk about different situations and circumstances that head. they related to. And they really liked me a lot. They liked me, they liked me a lot. And I got it, you know, and it was just fun after that first date. It was amazing. 
you guys got along pretty well, the, the four of you. You guys were friendly with one another, and did that ever depart from being a friendly relationship? Not really, not for me. I uh, didn't realize when I got there that there was dissension or tension between Diane, Holly, and Janice, or Janice and Holly against Diane. I never really saw that. And then after a while, a period of time, things were like uh, showing themselves as they're distancing Diane. Diane really befriended me, which was fine and good. She's like, okay, to her, I have a good friend here now since Diane and, uh, I mean, since Holly and Janice are talking to me, so to speak. And, but I just stayed very mutual with everyone because whatever went on and happened with them, as they were at some point very exceptionally good friends and kind of inseparable kind of things since they had been working together for so many years. So I figured maybe it would work out whatever happened. And I kind of heard a few rumors and you know, I just didn't want to get into it. And I didn't, I stayed mutual. Um, we've got a lot of questions from viewers, and I just brought up Mr. Goodson, so let's start with this one here. Uh, this is from Rob Montreal. Hello, Kathleen. I read your book, enjoyed it very much. Any of you talk about trying to bridge the rift between the models, first approaching Barker, who didn't want to get involved, then going to Mark Goodson, who called a meeting with you and Diane, Janice, and Holly, at which everything broke down. Holly and Janice storming off and nothing in the end getting resolved. Why do you think they were so resistant to making amends, burying the hatchet? How did it make you feel caught in the middle, and how did it affect you? Yes, I do remember the time when it, it was getting a little intense backstage with the girls, just in the air. You know how you, you said it, say it's so thick you can cut it with a knife, and things were getting kind of tough. I, I, I think maybe because they were dissing Diana, how they were treating her, but you know, I, I said, and Mark Goodson just happened to be in town. You know, he was out of New York, living there, and had a place here at the uh, Beverly Hilton Hotel, and. Uh, so I just pulled his car one day, literally, he said, Mark, I said, you know, I'm a new girl here, whatever. And I, I love being here, and thank you so much. And But I feel like there's a little tension backstage and between the girls with Diane, Holly, and Janice. I said, maybe, you know, you want to address that. Maybe we should have a meeting and talk about it. Let's see what's happening. I've always been a mediator, even with my singing groups of people that I've been involved with to mediate. And I never liked tension. I didn't like. I don't like working around it. I don't think it's necessary. And I think by all means, if any way it can be resolved through uh, negotiation or peaceful sit down and understanding, I'm always for that. So he did that. He invited everyone to a meeting, and uh, you know it went quite well. And, and I, I didn't say, and I don't think. Uh, Diane and Holly stormed off. I never uh, said that. They didn't storm off. They left before uh, John, Diane and I left out. So we feel that we did come to a pretty good medium or he made himself pretty clear in terms of uh, everybody just really trying to get along and make an uh, effort to do so. So was the personal relationship between Bob and Diane in full swing at this point? Oh, yes, yeah. it was. When I got there, it was. When you got there, it was. Yeah, when I got there, it was. It just kind of started a little bit when I got there. Uh, I wasn't really quite aware of it, but then it became a little bit more obvious when she'd go down in his dressing room because our dressing rooms were right close to one another. And uh, so it became a little more obvious. And, uh, you know, it was a, a com mutual relationship we were happy bob was a happy camper believe me okay <laughs> he let us talk and say things and what have you on the show which he usually let the girls do anyway but at uh, some point it just uh didn't happen anymore for he and diane his uh, lady friend uh, got a hold of the uh, situation and put a halt to it and bob just really didn't let diane go admirably like he should have and at the very end of the day, literally, she was a woman scorned. And so you guys got to be careful how you put down your women, not like dogs. <laughs> so then we know the answer to this question now. Owen oh, Chenault, was it true that Diane and Bob were sexually involved, involved sexually? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Like I said, they were. 
And, you know, they were happy. He was happy. You know, he was content. You know, but I was getting on there in age. And, and he did, she told him, you need a little hanky panky in your life. You know, after his wife had died, I never had the pleasure of meeting his wife, but I know they were very involved and very happy for many, many years. And I know that took a little step out of his pep out of his step, you know, being in man, manhood, and even being involved with another woman sometimes after you've been involved with, you know, a living with your wife for so many years. And it's, it's not, it's kind of a big adjustment. But uh, that's what it, all it was pretty much was a little hanky panky. He did care dearly for Diane, though. And, and it came, became very obvious on stage as well when we were uh, doing the show. You could tell when she nestled up next to him and elbow him and what have you, and it was like, mm, and tickling him. There were show episodes where, you know, and now as the star of The Price is Right, Bob Barker, the doors would open and he'd be kissing her. It, it was pretty open. No. Yeah. I never saw him. Yes, I've oh. seen him. Oh, I've my God. Him. You have? Oh, yeah. Not at the beginning. Probably not like, at the beginning, no. No, because he always comes out and Janice would give him the mic. But, oh my God, I never saw that one would be its worth its weight in gold there. Yeah, you need the, to the, dig that one up. There's an updated uh, chapter for your book, Kathleen. <laughs> Here's another question for you. Any oh, comment? Uh, Dan Trusevic, uh says, does... Uh, she think Diane was paid off with millions of dollars to drop the lawsuit against Barker. Diane disappeared and just sold her $4 million house. Where would she get that type of money? And then Nick Michael uh, follows up on that and says, um, uh, she said that Diane, uh, Kathleen Bradley's book, it said, she said that Diane lived a lavish lifestyle, had a few rich ex-husbands. She even mentioned them on air during the classic Barker's Beauties chats. Um, I realize some of this information may not be 100% accurate, but right. this is out there. So what do you think? So, was Diane paid off? No, she was not paid off to my understanding. Bob said, I'm not paying that woman one red penny. Interesting. He meant it. And that's really like what happened to Snowball Effect during the depositions that led to other things. But uh, she, to my knowledge, she did definitely did not get a settlement from the lawsuit she had to end up dropping it basically because she ran out of money and couldn't afford to pay her attorneys and she knew very well after the depositions were coming out that if she was wrong that she was not going to win that suit however i do believe she got money as a retirement package from the uh prices right when she left i'm certain of that she got a nice little retirement package. So without I don't admitting like any wrongdoing, they gave her some sort of retirement severance. Yeah, right, because she had been there so many years. She was entitled to it. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Do you have much relationship with any of these other models these days, Kathleen? Unfortunately not. Janice and I, we still have numbers. And every July, I would at least... Um, text her and say happy birthday or send her some photos of the family and she would be very pleased to hear from me but uh, other than that you know not too much and obviously I haven't spoken or seen Diane since the uh, lawsuit I mean since she left but I, I just you know some people told me that she was living in a certain place that they had like a Diane Parkinson sighting that she was out in the valley, I know she had lived out in North Hollywood for a long time. Then I believe someone said she moved to uh, Palm Springs, and uh, she was doing okay. I know Diane was is going to do okay. She she's sweet. She and I are a lot alike in many ways. Yeah, we're both both big flirts and sexual and just you know kind and uh, caring and just like you know very open and what have you. So she she was okay. She she thing for herself, which I'm sure she has done very well. So was it the depositions with regard to the Diane case, what really started driving wedges between the girls, or was it the Holly situation? <laughs> no, it wasn't the Diane case that was driving wedges between anybody, because you have to remember, Diane was gone at that period of time. But when she filed the lawsuit against Barker, we were all the models asked to do a deposition and say what we know about anything pertaining to the case 
in the relationship. And Diane, I mean, Janice and myself were amenable, as well as were many of the production people and producers, assistants, and whoever else they needed to call in, except Holly. Holly did not do the deposition. She did not want to do it. So Bob really did not like the fact that Holly was not going to give a deposition, especially, I would say, on his behalf, because everybody knew that Diane was lying. So she didn't do it, but after a while, period of time, some things just happened and transpired, and Bob held that resentment in towards Holly for a long time. And unfortunately, at some point, uh, she paid the price for it, and uh, she as well was let go for really not substantial terms why she should have been let go. And therefore, we had to do another deposition when Holly was suing Bob <laughs> for her wrongful termination. Hmm. So it became a snowball situation. But after Diane left and said that, it was sexual harassment. Bob really changed a lot in his demeanor on the show. You know, he was tainted. You can imagine if someone were to accuse you of sexual harassment or incest or something, knowing full well you didn't do it. It's so very difficult to get vindicated. There's the big headlines, Bob Barker, sexual harassment, blah, blah, blah. vindication on the third page. He didn't do it. Right. You know, people still have their mindset, and a lot of them still don't even realize or know it. Right. So, you know, that changed him a lot. And it, show, it showed on the show, actually, how he treated us, the models that were there. We never had a chance to speak again. We never said another word. He right. would usually put the microphone up to us or kill time if it was a double double overbid and have us say something, hi, or whatever, what you're doing. Little. He never, we never said another word. And none of you got to say goodbye to the, to the home audience none. at all. Ever. The only person who did get to say goodbye was Diane because she had planned her her, her right. exit. The rest of us were terminated un six uh, you know um, suspiciously uh, suspiciously or just you know not knowing we, we were hit real hard with that blindsided I must say blind sighted. So here's a question from Greg Palmer. Check this out. All right, Kathleen, which side of the beauties versus Barker, Diane versus Barker, Holly versus Barker side were you on and why? I was always on the side of the truth. I was on the side of obviously when Barker uh, had uh, said he didn't do sexual harassment against Diane. It was so evident everyone knew. And obviously I was on Barker's side. And uh, so there you have it. I was saying the truth that he was, you know, sexually, it was a, um, you know, con con consensual. Conventional. Consensual, thank you. It was conventional. Yeah, a lot of people uh, don't no, realize that. They call it an affair, but Bob wasn't married. I mean, no, he wasn't. And Diane, I, you know what, Diane and I actually, we would speak on the phone quite frequently when she left the show. So we were going, I knew it, I knew she was going to get ready and do the lawsuit. I tried to persuade her not to, but she did it anyway. And uh, we were talking. I think she, what really, really kind of got to her was seeing a younger version of herself through Gina Lee Nolan on The Price is Right when she left. Interesting. That kind of really triggered it and did it for her because she had high hopes and aspirations of going on to doing some other work or being a bigger and better model or acting or whatever she wanted to do. When she left the show, you know, she did Playboy magazine three times, which was frowned upon and some other things, which she, she it never really developed for her like she had hoped. And I, I know that was the reason that she just really sat home and stewed all the time. But needless to say, I was on Bob's side. But when Holly's deposition came around, I was still mutual, but I had to tell the truth. And Bob did ask Holly to lose some weight, but he did not tell her to stop taking her medications. Bob used to actually come into all of the girls' dressing rooms and tell us to lose a few pounds. When I got there, it was okay. It was acceptable. And you know, we go on hiatus and come back and maybe have a, like a 10 extra pounds on us, not realizing it. 
And by the time you try your your outfits on, it's like one time I thought I had on Diane's dress and she was like a size smaller than me. And I hadn't realized I had eaten that much on a hiatus off of like six weeks. And I had Cheryl, the uh, warrior lady, I'm, I'm like, look at that, look at the tag, Who's, that's not my dress. Sure enough, it said Kathleen. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> but we are hired for a certain weight, a certain look, a certain style, you know. And uh, Holly did start to gain a little weight because she had to take some uh, medication uh, that would make her thyroid, you know, the, um, get, put pounds on your steroids, rather. Mm. And that was one thing and reason Bob. But all along, Bob had it out for her. And she was getting less work to do on the show, hidden behind some cars, not going out or hardly barely in the show. So he was kind of weaning her out. And, uh, you know, I, I just told the truth that he... Uh, you know, they, they had it out against Holly. Uh, Kathleen, when, when you were introduced, you could feel that Bob was sort of making fun of Holly right there, saying she's clumsy and all that. Was that a jab at her, or was that just sort of an ongoing joke? Uh, wait, wait, say that again, when Bob was what? When you were introduced uh, at the very beginning, he kind of took a jab at Holly a little bit, saying that she was clumsy or whatever. Was that a jab at her, or was that sort of an ongoing running joke? Oh, at that time, that was an ongoing running joke because Holly was the klutz. You know, everybody that was on there had their little, like Diane was the sexy swimsuit model, Janice was the like stand-up models model, and Holly was the stumbling, klutz, falling, doing things, the refrigerator doors wouldn't open and she'd slip and fall. So she was the comic on the show. So, you know, that's why he said that. And everybody he said certain things to that pertain to their specialty, basically on what they were known for on the show. Gotcha. Uh, as a young man watching, I, I thought you were known for your legs. When God poured those legs, man, he just kept pouring, didn't he? Oh, yes, he did. Look at that shot. <laughs> love it, Brad. I remember. I love that shot. And, you know, I have, I have to say I'm so grateful to Richard Arthur, who used to be one of the grips on the show. Uh, not grip, but he was. Uh, he would take care of the props. He was a prop master. And he had the Polaroid camera from that show. And usually, you know, people, if you don't know the industry, you take Polaroids of some of the shots or clothing or things that you want to match and make sure in case you do some pickup shots or something. But most of the time, people, we did things in real time, so we didn't need it that much. But Richard would always go around snapping shots and photos of everybody in circumstances, situations, and backstage. And through him, thank God, I was able to have and keep these Polaroids, which are mine, to be able to put in my book that I own. And they're such keepsakes I would have never had. And I want to thank Richard Arthur one yeah. more time, Richard, my buddy. That's for nice. Those photos. All right, uh, here's another question for you from a, from a viewer. Uh, this is from Travis. What was Rod Roddy like off camera? <sighs> you know, Rod was just pretty much the same gleeful, gay, not gay, gay, but he was gay, but he, he, he owned it. But he was just so wonderful off stage and flamboyant, is what I want to say, with his costumes. And even when he came in to dress a little bit, he had almost a, a special little shirt and some jeans or something. But he was a lot of fun. Just a dear heart, a sweet, good man. I never saw him go off or have a bad day or say anything mean about anybody. He walked around, he did his job. He was just great, loved him dearly. Rich has a couple of his uh, his jackets as well. Yeah, I got some, I've got his baby shoes. I got a lot of stuff from uh, his estate. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh wow! You're yeah, right. His headphones. The headphones used on the Price is Right. Bunch of stuff. Did you oh. keep anything at all, memorabilia? Kathleen? Memorabilia? Not really. From time to time, I would ask the wardrobe lady if I could uh, uh, have some of the clothing. After we worn it, and I knew we weren't going to wear it again, I would ask. I said, "Can I have that? Can I wear it?" There were some clothes I wore out to some events that were really nice, and they let me wear it. So, because uh, that was a typical question 
from all the viewers. Did they let you keep the clothes? <laughs> no, they didn't let us keep the clothes. They usually gave them away to a women's shelter. But at, from time to time, if we'd ask for them and they were going to get rid of them, they would let us have some. As a matter of fact, and, one of, and, and the gifts, of course, we never were able to get any. But I got a, a set of golf clubs. That's when I really first started playing golf. I was asked to play from uh, my manager, agent, uh, Kathleen, can you play golf? I said, why? They said, because Stedman Graham, Oprah's boyfriend, is having a golf tournament. He's inviting a lot of celebrities from LA and flying everybody down to Chicago. And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, I can play. <laughs> I didn't know how to play. I took a crash course, and I also um, went in and asked the people from the company if I could borrow or get a, a set of the clubs. I said, your clubs are going to be at Stedman Graham's Golf Tournament. Everybody will know about them. And that was my first. And they sent me some clubs, wow. which was cool. Yeah, do you yeah. still golf at all, or was oh, it just, yeah. just the one time? She, she's so hard to get a hold of. Why? Because she's always golfing. <laughs> I was golfing yesterday, actually. I love to golf. I've played in so about well over 150 celebrity charitable golf tournaments over the years. Wow. And What's I your handicap? It's 16. That's good. It's a, yeah, yes, yeah, good. It could be better. And I just got a new driver I won. I was trying it out yesterday. Ooh. and pretty well and I just know my husband and I play our son's now playing with us and it's just a wonderful sport that really mentally it really sets you on a whole nother it's like a yoga of sports really because you do have to focus concentrate and it's your game nobody else you don't have a teammate you don't have right. to rely on anybody and if you mess up it's on you <laughs> So, you know, you just strive to be better. So I'm going to I'm gonna pop a picture up, and I just want to listen to you, okay? Uh, yeah. You know, he was such a great guy, Julio. Uh, Julio, Julio. Julio. Uh, we've met on several occasions in different places. This one actually was taken maybe last year, or I think maybe last year. Yeah. And I saw him, I was at Fan Fantasy Springs in Palm Springs Hotel, and he was performing there. And I was there with the Fred Williamson's The Hammers Celebrity Golf Tournament. And I hadn't seen him in such a long time. And so we said, yeah, let's get a photo. And that was the last time I saw him. What a great guy, stand-up guy. You know, he had gone through so much in life and experiencing and different things of that nature from where he came from to where he ended up and uh, just, you know, trying to spread the love and help some of the youth and recognizing, uh, you know, what you can do with your career. So it was sad. That's sad, right, sad. Do you know all the words left. to Gangster's Paradise? <laughs> no. You That's know? one thing about me. I, I'm, a, I'm terrible on words, even when I was with the singing groups. Wow. When I was singing for a couple of the songs on the Love Machine, and we would choreograph the song the uh, song when we perform for the words if he loves me tonight let's go away and <laughs> whatever and i would sing the wrong songs in the girl's like that is not the lyrics to go with that song that <laughs> and, and heaven forbid we were out the night before drinking coming to um, get on stage a little tipsy and hung over oh my god because we had such a wonderful lifestyle when we traveled. We met kings and queens and uh, uh, people from Monte Carlo and the Prince of Faha from Saudi Arabia. They catered to us. We just had a wonderful time. And we got a chance to go in Italy, all back in the background where normal people and tourists were not able to go in, in Sicily and people's homes. And oh my God, what a great experience. Quite the life. Yeah. Well, we're not going to ask you to recite the lyrics to Plastic Man. <laughs> Uh, I, might, I might know that. You might know I those? Might know Some of them. But we, we would split up, you know, the, um, the words, and uh, everybody would sing a little lead yeah. here and there because we liked doing the Temptation songs because there were five of them and seven of us. So, you know, some of the songs we like to split up the uh, leads on. They loved us, the Temptation. Those were our guys. We would hook up with them and 
um, Puerto Rico sometimes, they'd be working on one side of the island, we'd be working at the Ucamuca uh, place on one other side, and as soon as they finished their shows, they would rush over and see at the ending of our show, and they loved us, because we were kind of patterned after the Temptations, and as a matter of fact, obviously, we were with Motown Records for a short period of time, so we did a lot of uh, things that they did on their show, because it really gave an us, the girls, an opportunity, all seven of us, to shine during a couple of songs, you know? Do you keep in touch with any of the uh, girls who were in the group with you? Oh, absolutely. We're sisters. Joined at the hip. We always have been. Nice. We've always been great friends. Uh, two of the girls from the Love Machine have passed away. Hmm. And uh, Renee, my girlfriend, she, she works in the industry still, and she does a lot of work behind the scenes for the American Music Awards, the Grammys, and soap operas. And she's a, a rehearsal actor. And uh, one of my other girlfriends, Sandy, that was in the Love Machine, she's a songwriter. She wrote "Angel" for um, uh, uh, Nita Baker. You're my angel, oh my angel. Preach. She wrote that song, and she wrote a couple other songs and big hits. And uh, Bernie, she's a, a pharmacist, and just the girls have gone on to do really great things, and we're still friends. We hang out together every now and then, and it's it's just been wonderful. So you know, that might God, be your agent. Pick that up. That could be money. I know. Not. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. Um, here's another girl you worked with, and a question. Uh, this is from Daniel Westrick. Had you considered going on deal or no deal with Claudia Jordan, like Claudia Jordan did when that show aired? Uh, no, actually, I was not even offered the job. So I wasn't, uh, after I got off the prices right, I was really stunned for a couple of years and in a not a great place. And shortly, actually, well, before I got off the show, my favorite brother in all the whole world Scotty, he died. He died in 1999. I was let go on the show in 2000. So after that, I, I, had, I was in a real dark, bad place for a while. And uh, so I, I wasn't thinking about working again. Plus, I had a pretty decent settlement from the show. And uh, my husband, he's a mechanical engineer. and He makes a pretty decent living. So I didn't feel like I, I needed to really look for any work. I just, you know, I, I was happy at home. So, this is Claudia no. in this picture, isn't it? No, that is not Claudia. Who is that? That is the girl who came after Claudia. Oh, my God, and I cannot Lanisha? think of her name. That, that's yeah, Lanisha. That's, that's Lanisha. That's Lanisha? Boy, that's I, that, Lanisha. that doesn't ring a bell to me at all. I mean, I worked with yeah. Lanisha for a long, long time. Is that her? She that's looks her. so that's young. Her. Yes, did. Well, so do I. She, ah, <laughs> that is her. I've had the uh, opportunity to meet her. Outside of the show, obviously, she was having, gave a party or birthday or something, and she had got my number and invited me, and I was, yep, that's her. I love Lanisha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was a sweetheart. We can't get a hold of her. Ever since her legal issue with The Price is Right, she's like disappeared off the planet. Are you in touch with her? No, I am not. Have you tried Facebook or social yes, media? Yes, just will not respond. I don't know if she has wow. some kind of clause or something not to talk to anybody, but... Uh, it could. I, I did. I had I had a four year gag uh, clause in there. I couldn't say anything. It's one of the other reasons why I waited to uh, release the book. Yeah, so. interesting. A lot of people wonder. You know, they they look at what Bob Barker made and they just assume well everybody on the show made that kind of money. Um, I, I take it the models did not make that kind of money that would last a lifetime on that show. No, we did not. It was, and I was a little surprised when I first got on to sh on the show to see what little bit of money <laughs> we were making, a baby making. And I'm, a, I'm like, because you would think, hey, you're on TV, you're a model, you're on a show, and the show's big and popular, making money. But no, at that time we didn't, and uh, it was what it was. But you know, we got some pretty decent residual money even when we weren't working. Right. During the summer times, uh, for like six or eight weeks, our hiatus, we still get paid around the clock. And I did get a few raises over a period of time, obviously, for being there 10 years. And um, so um, they, 
finally, I think AFTRA came up with a an agreement that there was a, something that calls for a game show model, which they never had because we would just consider consider models right. on television. Hmm. So they did come up with a special something that helped protect us and give us a little more rights and retirement and whatever the game show models a rate, which when helped I, out a little. When I started there in 04, 2004, they were making $500 a show, doing two shows a day, six shows a week. We spoke with Roger Dobkowitz a couple of times on this particular program, and we have deduced that they're at about 800 a show now. What, wow. What were, they, what were you making when you started? Can you tell us? Gosh, you know what? I think something like $230 a show. Wow. I think so. I, actually, I have my paperwork here, and I look back at it. Because thank God it went all into the retirement fund for ten years. I got tenured. Right. Thank God I was able to get retirement fund. But as it went on, I don't think I don't know if I ever got up to five hundred per show. Right. But it was low, and doing three shows a day it, it added up. Of course, you get maybe a thousand dollars worth a day if you did three shows, and then the residuals were as much. But it just was back when it was. You have to figure what that was, what, 20 some years yep. ago, actually. Huh. So it would make sense that, yeah, they should be paying those girls much more. And the yeah. guys now, I, oh my God, two guys, right? Yeah. What would you have made, like, if you'd stayed in modeling and just continued to do regular modeling, would you have made more than that in a day? Uh, oh, yes. Absolutely. Well, it depends on what kind of job you would do. The modeling plays well when you do like big advertising for facial or cosmetics or uh, uh, of course runway pays very well. I was kind of at some point too big for runway. They like those little skinny models. And uh, so I did do more modeling for uh, Ultra Sheen hair products and different things of that nature. And they paid pretty good, like 2000 3000 $5,000. Wow. And even getting into commercials, I, you can make some real good money, $20,000 for doing a five-second spot on a commercial I did one time for Halloween for Hallmark. Man, I'll never forget that commercial. I wish I could get another one like that. <laughs> yeah. But it did it for Gary, you know. National. Uh, let me take you back to 1980 and hear your thoughts about Holy Moses and working with Richard Pryor and Dudley Moore. Right. That was quite a great time I'll there bet. and just on the set. And, you know, uh, that was in, when was that? You said the 80s? I thought it was in the 70s. It could have been. It, it, I'm usually wrong, so whatever your memory is, somebody will correct us online, I guarantee you. 78 or something, yeah, I think I marked that. But I had known Richard for many years. I met him when he was performing, and, and he'd come see the Love Machine every now and then. We became pretty good friends. But he asked me, you know, to be, uh, to be, in, the, be in it. And my, uh, my girlfriend Renee was in it as well. So we just we were just his little side piece, little Pharaoh girls, you know. Uh, and it worked out. It was just fun. What Too bad the like? movie, absolutely terrible. The movie was terrible, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. I mean, he was, he was serious when he was doing his work, but he was just still char charming. And he laughed a lot, you know. Just a charming guy, a lot of fun. Was it a party after hours? Oh, I mean, well, there were some parties now. Ah, we won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough said about that. We got a lot of, of viewer questions here. Let's see if we can get one. Uh, by the way, you know, when I put out some promotion for this, I said the first uh, a black model to ever grace the stage of The Price is Right. And I was quickly corrected. Dave, Dave's got this comment. Check it out. Yeah, this is from Mark Simpson right here. Uh, hey, Rich, did you know there was actually an African-American model on the very first episode of the nighttime new Price is Right with Dennis James in 1972. She was the only one in that one episode. She was only in that one episode. Don't know who she was, but after that, it was just Anitra and Janice. I think she meant Kathleen, Anitra and Kathleen. Yeah. But her name was no, Harriet. He's right, though. No, it was only Anitra and Janice in 1972. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's an interesting photo there. I'd like to get that picture. 
But yeah. uh, if it was for the nighttime, uh, because there was rumor around about a model being on the prices right prior to me, which is not true for the daytime, especially. Right. But there was a model who I know very well. Uh, Lord, my, my, her name is escaping me now. That she was a rehearsal model on the Price is Right. Oh. They used to have standards for Price is Right models. On the Bob Barker she version? Had, uh, no, um, in uh, the early days, in the 70s, 72 and 70, she was a stand-in. I don't think for the Bob Barker uh, version. I, I can't remember. She was telling me the story, and I could see her face was playing as day. Very pretty woman. Oh, God. And I have to think about it. But they were saying before there was a lady named somebody. They only came up with one name and nobody could verify it. And they had it on Wikipedia. I made them take it down. So as far as we know, unless they came up with some proof. I mean, this woman that was standing there, uh, I would like to see that photo. And it, it's conceivable that it could be a photo that was taken during a rehearsal or something as well. But to have a first black model, especially nighttime Dennis James on The Price is Right, I, I don't know about that. So, like I said, she could be in a stand. They did have stand-in rehearsal models. Interesting. And I'm going to uh, think of the name of the lady who did it. She told me the story, and she's like probably one of the only few other models that I know was behind the scenes working at the show during the 70s. And not the 80s, but the 70s for sure. This isn't so much a question, but a comment to you. Yeah, this is from uh, Kari uh, Shante White. Can't wait to watch this. Still remember when she was a permanent Barker Beauty in 1990. I was 12 years old and just started middle school. Hashtag beautiful African queen. Hashtag my favorite Barker Beauty. And this is the one I want you to see. Hashtag my game show TV mom. How does that make you feel when people say that kind of that stuff? That is so good. I love those hashtags. I have to use some. Oh, wow. That is wonderful. It, you know, does my heart well and good. When I go out to this day and people know me or recognize me from the prices right and just speak to me and tell me what joy I brought into their homes when for their mothers or grandmother. And, you know, a lot of college students would watch the prices right as well and they would actually um, set their uh, curriculum their timing for their classes around the scheduling of the prices right so they could watch it right that's but great. you know a lot of times i would be out in the grocery store or something and uh i've had somebody you know nudge and it's like i can tell they were going <laughs> then they come up with me they go Hey, aren't you that black girl on the prices right? You that black girl on the prices right? Huh? I'm like, yeah, I'm that black girl on the prices right. <laughs> so you were her surrogate <laughs> mom and Bob is her probably her surrogate dad. Well what what did yes. it what did it mean, uh, Kathleen, to you? And did you hear from viewers who would watch this? Let's say young girls of color who had perhaps not seen, you know, well, they hadn't seen on this show uh, a woman of color as a as a model. Um, did you hear from from young people who said, you know, hey, this is a sign that I, I might have an opportunity too, and you might might open the door for them? Absolutely. Um, I had young ladies come up to me and. A lot of them had written me letters, a lot of letters from family members and uh, photos they would send in and just say, you're a great inspiration. My daughter wants to be like you. Here's a photo of my daughter. She even kind of looks like you. And the girls were, you know, how do you get started? I ask for advice and I want to do what you're doing. And, you know, we're very proud of you. And, you know, all that, that it was just wonderful and heartwarming and still to this day you know people know me and recognize me and I get invited to certain events still and and being a you know iconic figure in the black community or so to speak and uh, broke a couple of color barriers here and there for different things so I love it oh we've got a lot of questions still from viewers and we're running out of time so let me try to blow through a couple of these real quick yeah this is from Phil Luxenberger hi Kathleen what sort of reaction did you get from your book backstage at the price is right memoirs of a Barker beauty I thought it was an intriguing book but I'm guessing some people are not happy about some of what was said in it 
Okay, well, as with memoirs, you can't please everybody. <laughs> Ask <laughs> Prince Harry. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta remember that. <laughs> and and Kathy Lee Gifford, huh? Whoever right. I mean everybody's doing their memoirs. Some people these young artists and people doing memoirs, they haven't even lived to be twenty five years old talking about my memoir, which is a joke, but everybody has a story to tell. And of course, you know, I was very careful in what I said in that book and make sure I could substantiate things that were happening. I looked at a lot of National Enquirer and different things. I did allude to it. I didn't say that it necessarily happened, but it was in print and word, and I alluded to certain people saying it and said certain things about what they said, and I was, you know, didn't uh, say it verbatim, but like Cheryl Paris, after she got left, let go, she was Bob's right-hand person, woman, person ever to do his bidding is doing and what have you and she got let go un, you know unsuspectedly and very not in a good manner she was really really hurt and she did do an interview with uh, the National Enquirer and people and she said some things that were really were not nice about Bob but were true and that was in her um, getting herself out and saying things about him and what have you and a lot of things I did derive from depositions over the years and things I had you know, heard maybe third hand, I don't really go by, but some of the people I know that work behind the scenes and how Bob treated them or said things to them that became uh, a fact. So, uh, of course, CBS was not a, a big fan. And when I would travel and do some book uh, reviews and uh, book signings um, and go and do some local television shows, CBS had already put out a memo not to talk to Kathleen Bradley or her representations, none of them, really? they would not even get back to my representative to say, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to have her on the show. They would wow. not even do that much. No, not at all. So the affiliates were, well, it was, uh, that was now that Bob's uh, out of the picture show wise, I guess it's all water under the bridge as far as that's concerned, huh? Well, he was actually not, I think it was off the show when I even, the, when the book came out. Oh. But it's not a Bob Barker bashing book, and I tell no. people that. It's my story, my accounting, my 10 years, and if people who have read it, it's more lighthearted and fun. I have you know, my great sense of humor put into it, and it's my timing in different episodes. It took a lot to really write what I wrote, and some of it pertained to The Price is Right, and I skipped around a little bit, but anything that did happen, I was on The Price is Right, even like the chapter I had when I went to see Oliver Stone because I was on The Price is Right and did get the movie Friday as Miss Parker, he saw that and he wanted me to come in for uh, a reading and just to meet me for a possible role in a movie. And I put that uh, in there. It's got kind of a funny, cute little uh, chapter in there, reading Oliver Stone. <laughs> but, you know, being on the show, it helped me go from one thing to another and different uh, avenues for the exposure, which I'm very grateful for. But it's a fun read, a good book, and hey, it's my, the truth known by Kathleen Bradley, okay? Well, from Barker, let's talk about Mrs. Parker. Alex Earl says, how did you get cast as Miss Parker on Friday? Well, actually, Ice Cube had always been watching the game show, The Price is Right, and Sorry since I was on there... Wow. Yeah, he, he said and told my agent, they, I guess they finally found me, uh, he, but he was telling the people, producers, I want that black lady on The Price is Right to play Miss Parker. <laughs> I'm telling you, I don't know if I had a name. I was always the black lady on The Price is Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the black lady on The Price is Right. So Ice Cube, yep, there I am. Uh, he uh, had me come in for an audition in front of a couple. Of, they only saw like maybe one other girl. They pretty much knew that they wanted to have me on there, uh, Miss Parker. And it was just an incredible time. I only shot like two days, but meeting Chris Tucker, which he wasn't as big as he was now. I Nobody even knew who Chris Tucker was then. And then Bernie Mac, I worked with him. He was pretty famous for his uh, comedy and uh, Tony Cox, my little husband, the little dwarf guy, sweetheart. But it was just, you know, you didn't, I didn't get to see and meet everybody. Obviously, if people know about making movies, you don't work with everybody that's in the movie if you don't have a scene with them. 
but it became, you know, such a big, iconic movie over the years. It's incredible. I mean, to this day, people know and call me Miss Parker all the time. Hey, Miss Parker, they have Halloween parties for Miss Parker. People dress up as me, as Miss Parker, every Halloween. That's awesome. Beyonce, Beyonce was me for Halloween. Her family, they all took a character from Friday and dressed up, not this year, but a couple of years ago. Her That's mom awesome. told me, uh, I know her mom well, and uh, what a treat, you know, to see me out there. And they do memes, they do kind of everything. Uh, caricatures and they have Miss Parker contests. Boy, oh boy, who would have thought it? Kathleen, you got a lot in your book. Uh, could you talk about where people can get your book? How do they, how do they get a copy of this? As a matter of fact, and I should have had this. That. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. You know the thing I do like about it. I'm gonna tell you though. I have a lot of great photos in here. I love photos and books because I really don't like to read that much. <laughs> but a picture says a million words. They can go on uh, and get it on Amazon right now and order it. Okay. Uh, I, I, what about Barnes and Nobles? I have to get it back up on Barnes and Nobles, but Amazon has it. And uh, I do book signings and travel. I just finished it in Ohio at my home state, Gerard, Youngstown. Had a 82 women there for a luncheon, and I did speaking. And the book uh, was just a wonderful time to be back at my hometown. And my aunt turned 100 years old, so I invited her to come out. Oh, oh that's nice. great. Well, OH to you. And anyway, on my Instagram, Kathleen Bradley underscore Mrs. Parker. Oh, that's great. Nice. Hey, you did not get it. Yeah, I'm sorry, you did not get a chance to say goodbye on The Price is Right. Before we leave you, what would you have wanted to say? Wow. Where's my Rolex? No. <laughs> the gold watch, remember. No, I would have said, oh my God. I think about that sometimes. I would have just said, you know, been thankful. I'm so thankful to have been on this show as a viable part of this iconic show for 10 years. And I'm, you know, going to miss everybody. And that was the hardest part, missing everybody and not being able to say goodbye. But since I'm able to say goodbye now, I love you all dearly from the producers, directors, to the cast members and the models. I do love and miss every one of you. And I do love Bob, too. Bob has a special place in my heart. He's a special guy. And we love you too, Kathleen. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Again, the book is Backstage at the Price is Right, Memoirs of a Barker Beauty by Kathleen Bradley. Uh, it's a great read, and there's a lot in there that you don't know about the Price is Right. I would check it out if you're a fan. Thank you, Kathleen, for being on. So great talking to you. Thanks for being with us. Uh, she is just terrific, isn't she? Oh, I, I knew this would be a good one. Uh, yeah. She's just fantastic. I mean, she was there. She was there for the whole thing, the meltdown of the original three, all the all the lawsuits and the, what was truthful about it what wasn't so uh, just really nice to hear it from from somebody that was there you know yeah if you're just listening to this podcast uh, by the way we've got a lot of pictures uh yes. you know, terrific pictures and video and, yeah and video uh, so where can you find that video? Uh, you can go to our dedicated Facebook page, facebook.com slash come on down podcast. Uh, shortly after this show is posted, uh, we'll start putting up the video and the pictures. Every week we try to pop populate the uh, Facebook page with what's going on there. But, um, you know, if you, if you watch us on YouTube and you want to listen back, it's on every... Uh, audio yep spotify apple yeah. music all those all those things so there's a chance but uh, go to our uh, 10 tampa bay youtube page yes uh and you can you can watch any of these video uh podcasts here just go to youtube and search for 10 tampa bay you will find it there and you'll find kathleen in all her glory today she was just uh so much fun and such a pleasant so person. regal and she's always uh, kept that presence about yeah, her you, you can know tell what i mean the, this entire time just a, a really sweet woman you can tell she she's a Buckeye through and through yeah. at the at the heart of it. You know it. Uh, you know from an O H from an O H to an I O on the other side of the country. Here, yeah. uh, it was so nice to nice to talk to her and hear about her story, her family, and just who she is as a person. Because uh, you get one image on air, which right. was terrific, but off air you realize just how real she is and authentic, right. which is really fun. So, anyway, great to have Kathleen with us today, and we appreciate you being with us as well. We hope to see you next week for another episode of Come On Down!
Thanks for tuning in to Come On Down with Rich Fields. See more photos and videos mentioned on this episode. Plus, interact with Rich on Facebook at facebook.com slash come on down podcast or on Twitter at come on down pod. Have a question for Rich? Use Facebook Messenger to connect on our Come On Down Podcast Facebook page. And remember, new episodes are live every Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern.